Welcome everybody. So glad you made it on a smoky Wednesday afternoon. Oh, I just thought, is it Wednesday? Am I the mm -hmm. only one that loses track of days here? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to keep admitting people as they come. Okay, it's 4.02. Let's just go ahead and get started to respect everybody's time. Once again, my name is Natalie Galindo. I teach speech communications here at PCC. I am a talker, but guess what? I'm not talking today. I am the moderator. So I will just be asking questions and letting our wonderful panel share their experiences. We'll go ahead by letting our panel introduce themselves and we'll kind of just do it the way I have it on my screen. I have have Gabby Ingrid, um, Robert, let's see, Gabby Ingrid, Robert, Rafiq, and Elizabeth. That should work. Okay. All right. So, Gabby, if you can just introduce yourselves, tell us who you are and what you do. Just give us a couple seconds. Gabby. Gabby, can you, uh, you're on mute. Yeah. I'm mute. My name is Gabriela Kopal, and I am a part-time instructor for anthropology at PCC. Gabby, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ingrid, you're next. Hey, everyone. I'm Ingrid Flores. Uh, I'm a social worker, and I work for a um, nonprofit organization in Glendale that helps homeless individuals to get rehoused. And I'm here the housing. Um, the housing now case manager. Great, thanks Ingrid. Robert, can you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon colleagues. My name is Robert Farrar and I'm an instructor in the social science department at, as I call it, Lancer Land, PCC. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Rafiq? Hello everyone, my name is Rafiq. Um, I uh, went to PCC for a uh, grand total of five years um, and then um, I went to UC Davis for my undergrad um, and then I went to Boston University for my master's in public health and now I'm at uh, UCLA doing my PhD in public health. Great, cool. Thanks Rafiq. Right right How about you Elizabeth? My name is Elizabeth Bogomel. I'm a fifth year PhD student um, in sociology and kind of public policy as well at UCR. And um, I've also done community organizing and entertainment marketing. So I have like a diverse background that I can speak to. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. So really this panel is just to kind of get different perspectives um, from people who are working in different areas and kind of see how social justice plays a role in what they do or in their lifestyle and things like that. So we're just going to kind of hear some of their stories. So we'll start. Uh, we'll start with Gabby. What was? What is your career path? What made you decide on your career uh, that you are in now or that you've done before? You know, I started basically teaching already in high school. I helped uh, a friend of mine to pass the math exit exam. <laughs> so basically, I always taught. I mean, that's the most interesting thing. And actually, uh, I actually started as a biology major, but I'm a bioanthropologist. So, and uh, so, but I have a bio degree. So, and um, I was, I was really interested. I had a really good science teachers in middle school. And this actually I really wanted to go into research and sciences. And while I was an undergraduate, uh, uh, I double majored in cultural anthropologist because I was interested in human rights issues. And that's what I finished in the United States at UCLA. So, so I basically have a social science and the bio, bio and the sciences degree both. And I did other things in my life. I also worked as an applied anthropologist and on HIV and uh, and AIDS project in the United States. I worked with healthcare practitioners. Um, and I also did some program administration. Uh, I uh, administered a program on community projects and um, I was very politically engaged since I'm an undergraduate and that has something to do with the political times. So, but I wanna go Later this ad. So actually, my uh, activism started in my first day in college, <laughs> and uh, so I really didn't know what was the things because what I've learned it's not enough. 
to just do something, you also maintain, need to maintain the condition in order to do what you would like to do. And, uh, but you know, it was a different political situation in Germany. So I will talk about that later, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Gabby. How about you, Ingrid? What made you choose this career path? Well, um, it was kind of like a jeweling thing. Uh, I started working at CEC, at the Non-Credit Division of PCC. And when I was working there, I was helping a lot of students uh, with like searching for classes, with their um, academic plan. And I was doing all this stuff. Uh, and then um, one day I started talking with one of the, the counselors. And so I asked her, so what, how do you got uh, like to this position? How, how what, what do you study or what do you do? So she, ta um, she told me that in order to do that position, I had to have a counselor degree. Uh, so I had to, besides my BA, I had to also had a master's degree in something related like counseling, social work, or um, education. So then uh, I, at that time I was doing psychology at PCC. And then when I transferred out, I discovered that Cal State Lee had a one year program in social work. So I was like, okay, that's my way to go. <laughs> I will be a counselor in like three more years. Um, once I started this, uh, I started doing, um, uh, once I transferred out and I changed my major, I started like taking more classes in social work and I discovered that it's like a, like a why, like a lot of um, a job opportunities in different areas, not only education, but also um, in nonprofit organizations, in the government, and even in the private sectors, you can do like a lot of stuff with social work. You can do community organizing. Uh, you can work with children, adults, um, with foster foster youths. So then uh, I was taking a homeless class and I discovered that, they, that they, there is a need for helping others, uh, like the homeless population. So when I did my internship, I decided that I wanted to do it with homeless or with foster youth. So I got lucky and I got placed in a homeless agency where I'm working now. And that's how I ended up working with homeless. But I still, I'm still planning to go for my master's degree. So that way I have even more um, openings uh, when it comes to jobs. Good to you, Ingrid. Okay, next is Robert. Robert, would you like us to call me, call you Robert or do, is it Dr. Farrar? Is that how do you pronounce Robert's it? Robert's fine, Robert's fine. Okay, no. you earned the doctor. So I just wanna make sure. Uh, okay, tell us about your career path, please. Sure, I'm gonna connect my career path to my sense of activism. Sure. Going back to 1975, I was a sophomore at Pasadena High School and my friend and I, we protested by walking out of class with a concern about the lack that there was no diversity on the homecoming court. And Pasadena High School at that time was over 4,000 students and a large number of us were students of color. So we thought that it was absolutely unfair to not have a court resemble us. The same year I had an instructor uh, who just really instilled in me a, a sense of love of history. And from 1975 till today, uh, I've pursued it on the undergraduate and graduate levels. And like one of the colleagues in here said, you know, he graduated from PCC. And I remember my days back in the 80s uh, at PCC and thinking, who knew? Who knew uh, that that would be something that is part and parcel of what I do? So I've been real fortunate uh, to teach at a variety of different uh, institutions. And PCC is my latest sort of drop off point. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you, Robert. Rafik, you're next. Can you tell us a little bit about your career path and how you came to be where you are? Yeah. Um, well, uh, a lot of people in public health kind of say we just like end up in public health. We don't actually like pursue it or uh, look to be in this field. You kind of just stumble into it. Um, and that was definitely the case for me. Um, I, uh, I started at PCC and um, uh, at a high school and was a, a pre-med like most other people were. Um, 
And, uh, and so I did that and it, it took me a while once I transferred and um, I was still pre-med and um, I, I really had an interest in um, issues like uh, substance use and homelessness and kind of how, you know, social issues interact with uh, biological issues, things like that. And uh, I was meeting with someone, uh, he was a mentor of mine at the time. And, um, you know, I kind of told him what I was interested in. And, and, you know, he asked me a couple of questions and he's like, it doesn't sound like you want to be a doctor. It sounds like you want to go into public health. And I was like, well, what, you know, what's public health? I don't really know what that is. And, you know, he kind of described it to me and, and it was, it was everything I was interested in, which was, you know, thinking about systems and thinking about um, how do, you know, higher level things impact the individual um, I wasn't just interested in medicine and, and biology. I was interested in, you know, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so that's kind of when I learned about uh, public health. And um, after graduating from Davis, I went to um, work for the county of LA uh, in their substance abuse prevention and control department for one year. Um, and then I spent uh, two years uh, kind of doing an internship with this NGO in uh, the Southern Philippines. Um, and then eventually applied for my master's in public health and uh, so now my, my focus is mainly on research and the topic that I'm, I'm focusing on is uh, kind of the intersection of uh, substance use, incarceration, and, and race, um, and just kind of thinking about how those three, uh, you know, work together to, you know, create a really terrible system. Um, and, um, you know, it's cool because I get to interact with a whole bunch of different, you know, aspects. I get to interact with, you know, the, the medical part of it. I can interact with the social sciences part of it the research part, the activism part. I mean, public health is really a, a cool field because you can, you can do really a whole bunch of things. Um, if you're more interested in the math of it, you can be an epidemiologist and you know, just be a biostatistician. I mean, so there's, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Uh, but one of the cool things that I love about it and why I think I found myself in it is because uh, social justice really is just a core tenant of public health and, um, and thinking about how, you know, what creates health is really our environment that we're in and the laws and policies that we find ourselves in. Um, and if those are not just, we're not going to, you know, find ourselves, in, you know, in a healthy population. So um, I love thinking about all those things. Thank you, Rafiq. Elizabeth, how about you? How did you get started on your career path? Hello. Um, so I worked in entertainment marketing um, for several years and didn't quite find it as fulfilling as I had hoped. <laughs> um, so I went back for my master's degree. Um, uh, so I started with the master's, with the bachelor's and then the master's. Um, and then I decided that I wanted the PhD after dabbling in the master's. Um, so I went to CSUN and uh, got involved there and realized that I wanted to do research on um, how people are in organizations and how organizations can help facilitate like happiness. I saw people at work unhappy. <laughs> um, so I really, really enjoyed research. I think that was one of my favorite things and teaching. Um, so I decided uh, particularly um, to focus on program evaluation, which is a type of sociology research um, that looks at the processes of community, organizational, institutional, and government programs um, and how those processes are effective or ineffective and how one can improve them. Um, so a lot of people from my program went on um, simply with a master's degree to do program evaluation and that sort of thing. Um, but I wanted to contribute um, a little more. So I wanted to contribute additional research, not just changing programs, but research on how you could change programs to be more effective for communities. Um, and so I went on for the PhD. Um, in my PhD, uh, I taught. Um, I've uh, done research. Um, I've done uh, program evaluations for programs on campus. Um, my areas of focus are communities and health, um, particularly underserved communities, and that led me to um, my dissertation uh, research. And our, for context, a dissertation is like your really big project at the end of your PhD, and um, it lasts sometimes a year if you're lucky, sometimes several years. Um, you're just doing research on whatever your topic you find most fascinating. Um, so I'm looking at mutual aid groups, which are uh, grassroots community organizations and how they connect individuals to needed resources during the COVID pandemic. Um, so that's kind of where social justice comes in for me in my research, um, but it's uh, permeated itself through teaching too. Um, because when you approach teaching, um, especially in, well, in any uh, area of the United States, um, 
you have to take a social justice approach uh, because um, you have to consider students' lived experiences um, and be as flexible and understanding as possible to those lived experiences, but also um, uh, being able to meet um, students where they're at in terms of sharing your knowledge and learning from them. Um, and then also I saw uh, through teaching and through my research that um, a lot of policies weren't uh, useful in um, serving communities. And uh, so I decided to focus too on um, public policy. So I'm earning like a second degree in public policy. Um, so hopefully I can implement changes directly by conversing with policy. Cool. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, so the next question is uh, for the panelists is, was there anybody along the way who really helped like motivate you? Was there like a person that really kind of helped you maybe get to where you are or, you know, somebody in your life or in your maybe school or career, things like that, that really kind of helped you be, you know, become who you are or, or uh, show you the career path? Gabby, we'll start with you. I think it was my mother. Uh, I have a solid working class background, so my mother was a garment worker. And I'm the first one, uh, I'm the second one in my family to go to college, and I'm the first woman at all. So, and uh, she always pushed me to have my own education. Uh, she's a World War II survivor and a refugee, so she didn't have a lot of opportunities. Uh, she didn't have job training. Through the war, she went to eight years to school, so she wanted to have me better opportunities. She was also displaced during the war, and that generation seen a lot of terrible things, both my parents, so she pushed me a lot. And then I wasn't originally college track, so I went to a high school that had um, tradition to work with non-traditional students with working class backgrounds. And uh, they were kind of very innovative, and I think they're kind of, kind of gave me the strength. I felt I could do anything. And, um, and I think the other uh, source I would have to think, think is the Social Democratic Government of, the, of Germany, because they already gave me financial aid to stay in high school. Mm -hmm. And they gave me financial aid to go to college and grad school, so I had zero debt. <laughs> and actually, originally, all my financial aid was free money. And after that, after three, four years, it was an interest-free loan. <laughs> so I think I have to thank the social democracy of Germany for doing well. <laughs> and um, actually, they tried to implement fees in my first years of undergraduate. And we just res resisted statewide. We just shut all the public university down for a week <laughs> because we did not see how we could pay this, what they wanted to intervene. And we were successful. So at uh, uh, university education from undergraduate and grad school in Germany, uh, public education is pretty much free. So I think without that, with my social background, I would have not made it perhaps as easily because I could use my financial aid to, uh, to, uh, to um, survive. Also, there were other hurdles. When I started sciences, it was a male-dominated discipline. So we had to fight multiple parts. So we actually, I was actually in a coalition to find for quotas for women in public office and also in sciences. Uh, when I went to school, I had two female professors in the sciences. This has completely turned around. And uh, we had housing issues. And I went to school uh, in sciences when it was the height of the environmental movement in Germany. So we were really trying to, even in sciences, have a career that's meaningful. So we were trying to have meaningful curriculum already. Uh, so we didn't want to do something that's good for the public in general. And that's the same thing when I went into cultural anthropology. I want to do something meaningful in my job. Uh, so, uh, so it's been like that for me ever since. 
So my social justice fight basically started on day one when I was a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> because of the political things that were going on at the times. So, um, um, so we kind of had to fight for our own conditions and we we're trying to uh, also create change. And my generation was really successful in changing environmental policies in Germany. So, um, yeah, so uh, basically that after that, both of my parents were union members. Uh, my grandfather was a union member uh, and all my family was always very much interested, very working class, but very interested in politics. So, mm. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. How about you, Ingrid? Was there anybody that helped you along your career path or somebody, maybe a mentor that kind of guided you? Well, I have been lot, so lucky and blessed to have a team of mentors. Um, I have been always work, if, uh, thinking like on my past, uh, when I was living in Honduras, I was um, helping uh, homeless kids. Uh, but then when I came here, everything was different. So I started working in, in education and that kind of like gave me a, a like another perspective and I discovered that I t and I tell this to all people, higher education here is a business. If you don't know, you can get in debt, like a high debt. So um, I started working at CEC and as I told you guys before, I started like asking the counselors there, I, um, uh, Blanca, she, she was amazing and she was, she, she shared all experience through the years. And, I, I like ask everybody in there like how you got to this position, how, uh, what was, what, what is your experience, what did you, did you study, what are you majoring in? So the more that I asked, I was like getting a more clear ideas of what in what pie in what path to lead my career and also what to study, uh, and also I started this covering how to pay for school. Then I also start working for with high school students. And I discovered that here, when you get off of high school, you don't really have like a technical degree where you can go and work. So you need to go to college and you need to get a, a bachelor degree in order to get a good paid job. So I started working with high school students and I learned a lot, uh, well, I'm still working with them and I have learned a lot from that program. And that also guided me to that and made me realize that I'm really good at that, like not only helping people, but also guiding them in like into the career goals. Um, also, um, it, yeah, uh, what I, I asked a lot to different people. Uh, then I started doing social work and I started taking social work classes. And I also see that, uh, saw that there is no only unfairness in education, but also in housing. And especially for those that have grown in po poverty, it's kind of like a cycle that is hard to get off from. And if they don't have the people that help them through the process, it's even harder. Or if the, the people that are there to help them, um, if they don't like find, if they don't really have the tools or they don't, they don't really know how to do it, it's, it's really hard for, for those people to like improve themselves or improve the living situation. So I can say like, I had, I have, a really good team of mentors in my workplace. That's great. That's great, Ingrid. And you pointed, you touched on something that like you asked questions, like you kept asking and asking questions. And I think that's like such a key that students on here or students everywhere should learn. Like it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to kind of be curious. Like that curiosity is what's going to help you in your career path. Uh, Robert, how about you? Was there anybody who helped you um, or, you know, kind of guided you along your path? You're on mute, Robert. Yeah. Use them well. I'll be as brief as possible. My boo, my wife of 39 years, has been the constant. She has seen me from being an undergraduate TA to a GA, extended substitute teacher, all the way to the point 
to where I am now. So uh, her inspiration of imparting wisdom, insight, guidance uh, has just been priceless. There, been, there have been other people I can think of, my uh, recently departed mom, uh, who instilled in my sister and I a love of reading, of reading, and reading books in particular. I can think of one of my high school instructors, Dr. Thelma Reyna, who, as a sophomore in high school, noted some kind of level of promise, and she encouraged me as many years as she could. And just countless individuals, but a group that I jokingly refer to as the KEDS, K-E-E-D-S, uh, America's Youth. Whenever I'm in a setting, whether it's face-to-face -face or Zoom, there's a certain amount of exuberance and love for the art of teaching uh, that just sort of uh, encompasses my thought and my being. And so I, I have too many people uh, to think of mentors professionally and personally, but uh, I have to go with my wife, Kathy, uh, as the catalyst for that which I do. Thank you, Robert. We'll try to find a way of getting this recording to her so she can see this as well. <laughs> And she's on a Zoom in the other room. So I'm like, boo, are you hearing me? <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robert. How about you, Rafiq? Was there anybody that helped you along your path? Um, yeah. I mean, I would say there's been there are people like, you know, throughout the whole path uh, that have been there in each step. Um, I think mentorship, um, especially, I mean, in any field is important, but especially if you're going into academia is, is really important. But um, I, I'm going to focus on four. Uh, so the first one would be my parents, uh, count them as one. Uh, but uh, my family and I were, um, we were originally from Cairo, Egypt, and we immigrated here when I was about five. And uh, one of the main reasons why my, my family immigrated was for education and just uh, uh, the opportunities um, that I have here, um, I would not have had in Egypt, um, especially just some of the uh, religious and political tensions. Um, I come from a small Christian minority in Egypt. And uh, we just are, you know, we're, we're very hard to, to climb up the ranks in, in universities or in, in government, things like that. So um, one of the main reasons why we immigrated here was really for education. Um, so my parents really have been a, a big inspiration and, and motivation for me. Um, and then the rest of the three um, are all uh, PCC professors. And um, I'm not saying that just because this is a PCC event. Uh, they mm -hmm. really were um, the ones who radically changed the, the trajectory of my life. And, um, and I'll tell you now, I've now been to, you know, four different, you know, higher ed institutions, and uh, you will not meet professors better than the ones you have at PCC. Um, at the university level, that they're not there to teach, they're there to do research. And most of the time, they are really bad teachers, actually. So um, that's, you know, it's a whole other conversation, but, uh, but your professors at PCC, they're there because they, they are passionate about teaching and about teaching you. Uh, but so the first one um, was Dr. Beliki. Um, she was a chemist um, and she, she actually passed away uh, several years ago. Um, but I, I had taken her general chemistry class and I failed it. And I went into her office and I, you know, I got an F. Like, it, you know, it wasn't like a D minus, like, no, it was just a straight up F. And um, you know, I said, hey, like, do you think I should just like switch majors and switch career paths? And she was, she just like simply said, did you try your hardest? And I was like, no. She's like, okay, take it again, try your hardest. And if you don't do well again after trying your hardest, then yeah, maybe consider something else. Um, so I took, it was Chem 1A. I don't know if it's still called that. I took it again and um, I got like an A plus. Um, I tried my hardest and did really well. Um, and if it wasn't for her, you know, telling me to take a, a second chance, I would, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Um, the other two professors um, were uh, Professor Foster, um, who's the one that uh, kind of uh, invited me to come to this. Um, and she's a biology uh, professor um, and, and Professor Harmon. And they were just uh, both uh, really encouraging and really pushed me to um, critically think in class. And I know that sounds like so cliche and obvious, but um, in, in a lot of the earlier science classes in high school and even in college, they're not asking you to critically think. They're just asking you to memorize. Uh, when I got to UC Davis and started taking uh, some of the upper division biology and biochemistry courses, there was no thinking. I just was memorizing pathways and names of things. But um, during my science classes at PCC, um, I was really asked to, to really think and to provide answers to um, things that couldn't just be regurgitated or repeated. 
Um, and uh, so th they really, uh, I think, had the biggest impact on me and uh, till today use a lot of those critical thinking skills. So, yeah. You're muted. Natalie, I, swore, I swore I wasn't going to do that, but here we are. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Um, all right, Elizabeth, how about you? Is there anybody that has helped you on your path? Um, so there's a couple of people. Uh, first, my parents. Um, I had a unconventional schooling situation growing up. Um, I was partially homeschooled, partially unschooled. It was complicated. Basically, like, I struggled a lot because I never learned my multiplication tables because I was too busy playing outside type thing. Um, so, but they did teach me something really important and that was curiosity. So like, even if you feel like you're struggling in certain areas, like I am crap at math, but I'm great at statistics. <laughs> um, so even if you feel like you're struggling in certain areas, like, um, that doesn't mean you're not good in all areas. Um, and that was really important for me to sort out and they helped me with that. And then also they encouraged like almost an irritating sense of curiosity and asking questions. Um, so like, I'm always the one in class or in meetings or whatever, who like raises my hand and asks like back to back questions, like explain this to me, why do we have to do it this way? Why aren't we doing it another way? That sort of thing. Um, so I think that was really important because I'm going into like research, um, and, uh, teaching and that sort of thing. And students have lots of questions. And then also with research, like it's important to have your own questions. Um, but even uh, just if you decide to only stop at a master's degree or stop at a bachelor's degree and to work within communities, um, asking questions on why things are done certain ways is like really important. Um, and because you're only one of the only ones asking those questions, um, it draws attention to you in a good way and also puts the onus on you to help solve some of those problems, um, which hopefully is like a responsibility that people want because that's a good responsibility. Um, and then second, for teaching uh, my students, so this is kind of an interesting story. Um, I was in my master's program and about halfway through, I was going to drop out. I just, it was like a single class that was making me miserable. It was a stupid class too. It was like sociology of music. It wasn't a class that I should be struggling in. Um, <laughs> but uh, it made me like very upset. I wasn't enjoying it at all. But then I started TAing, which is being a teaching assistant for a undergrad class at a usually Cal State or four-year school. And um, that means like I was in charge of helping to teach the students, uh, which felt incredible. It was like the best feeling in the world. And the reason why was because like I was learning the material. You have to know material in order to teach it to other people. So like I was really learning the material. And then also getting to interact with students and having them like excited about what you're excited about. Like that's so fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, uh, like teaching is fun, but what is really awesome is when students come to you and they're like, how do I get into like a master's program? Or like, how do I apply for this scholarship? Or um, how do I apply for a PhD program? Or what do I do with a bachelor's in sociology? Or um, a master's degree in sociology? Uh, that may seem silly, but um, oftentimes in, um, in education, they don't train you how to figure out jobs that best fit for you. Um, but because I bounced around so many times and had to find alternative jobs for myself <laughs> um, beyond the typical academic jobs, I love like brainstorming with students what they're interested in, how they can use, use the tools that they acquired through their education to like apply it to their community or to their job or to making the world better. So that's really fun. Um, and then the last person um, that inspired my research is actually somebody I don't know the name of. Um, they, when I was TAing, um, they were a student in one of my classes and they were explaining to me that they had submitted the homework late, um, because they were trying to submit it, uh, online through the library and they couldn't submit it at home because the Starbucks had closed and they seemed to be like going in circle and asking like, what's, what's going on? And they finally confided that they were living in their car. They were kicked out of their house. And um, they couldn't get a hold of any resources on campus and we're looking for resources. Like, this is weird. We should have some way that we're serving, like this is a Cal State. We should have a way that we're serving homeless students. Um, but we didn't. And I called 15 different offices and nobody could help me. All I got was like a food bank or like some organizations off campus. And that was so bizarre to me. And that's like what 
led into my research. It's like there's whole groups of people that just aren't being served, but also in teaching, like, are we considering students who have all of these situations happening in their lives, especially now with COVID and with um, the fires and everything and with um, the, uh, the situation surrounding um, police violence and all of that, um, it's really important to consider students' personal lives. And so I try to bring that into, hopefully, um, my teaching, uh, but also my research. And that student, even though I don't know their name, they like forever change like the way that I'm approaching everything. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. And that kind of ties into one of the last questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, so I would really like to hear your take or I'd like you to share, um, what is your definition of social justice and how do you think what you do or what you hopefully plan to do in, in your careers, um, how do you think that will be a part of it? Um, so Gabby, can you start and just give us your definition and give us what you do that you think is um, working with social justice or what maybe what you hope to do? Well, I think um, my personal definition of fit here for justice is that people have equal access to opportunities and also that some basic needs are taken care of in a society. So it's housing, food, education, and health. I know this is very unusual to the United States, but I grew up in a country that had health insurance for everybody since the late 19th century. <laughs> So, uh, and then also having the same kind of resources available for everybody. So not only because you grow up in a low income neighborhood that your resources are worse than in high income areas. Should have, if it's government funded, it should all be the same access. And really you have a society that takes care of basic needs and uh, takes care of also of them. I think you judge a society how they deal with the most vulnerable. So young people, older people, people who are sick, people with mental health issues. So that would be my issue for social justice. Um, and um, how I would do with that, uh, you know, for my personal life as an undergraduate, we fought for that ourselves. Uh, so we were politically active, we actually advocated for our own rights. And also being active in political situations, I've done that throughout my career. As a graduate student, I was on the organizing committee for Sage UAW at UCLA, that's a graduate student union at UCLA. We were founding a union for graduate students and fighting for people to have health insurance and grievings procedures because I didn't like my situation. So I've been always in the situation where I didn't wait for other people to do something. I was a move uh, to, to change the situation themselves. So we didn't wait that somebody gave us free education. We demanded free education. And we were successful in doing that because in order to do good work, you need to have a good situation to actually do that kind of work. So if you don't have food, you don't have housing, you don't have health care, it's just really hard to do that. It's the same for our students. And the other thing is I chose certain issues for cultural anthropology. I worked a lot on migration. I've interviewed refugees from Central America at a time when the community did not have scholars themselves. So I wrote one of the first ethnographies description on the Central American community in LA. Uh, I did work on the US border in a shelter for migrant. I lived in the shelter for months. And also, so what you're trying to do is actually uh, use your knowledge to transfer it to other people. So you can actually use your knowledge to actually make other people clear what that means, okay? Uh, for me also, it meant to teach community college. I tried private uh, liberal arts colleges. I tried private education. I did some interesting things. I had, had a lot of my wealthier students be in community internships to see how social differences work in the United States. But I just feel way more at home at, in public education. So I think even teaching community college is an issue of social justice and working like doing higher education for everybody and not a selected group. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. You're welcome. You're welcome. How about you, Ingrid? Uh, what is your definition of social justice and how do you think you are being a part of that or want to be a part of that in the future? Well, it's kind of the same, a lot, um, as Gabby says, is advocating for those that are um, the most vulnerable, um, finding resources, um, advocating for people, empowering them to use those resources. And the, the way that I see it is, the way that I see that I, uh, I'm helping in my community is that I'm helping my clients and my students to go over, um, to cover those basic needs. So, um, like housing, um, financial education, um, knowledge, or any other um, basic needs that they might are that they might are lacking right now. So that way, um, once they have the basic needs covered, they can focus on uh, improving other areas of their life and on accomplishing their goals. Thank you, Ingrid. How about you, Robert? What is your definition and how do you think you are um, following it or going towards it? Well, in essence to me, social justice would be where there was an issue or issues that a person or a group of people find of importance. It could be what we're going to find out with the educational disparities in the Zoom kind of a world that's going to creep up within the next few months. It be compared to the majority. You know, there's a myriad of different issues. What I try to do as a, what I call an academic activist is to use the platform of education to share these kinds of issues with my students, to give them sort of perspectives of whether they write, public speak, protest, just giving them the historical and contemporary perspectives uh, that A, they can't live in a world where they just want to get through these things. They're in it. They're in it. And there are some of us uh, that that's a lifelong process of never being content with uh, the satisfaction of accomplishment. And there's a powerful short video by Bryant Gumbo of HBO entitled The Black Tax. And I think it would apply to a lot of us here on the call because he relates to the fact that as a 72 year old man, highly touted, professional, multiple Emmys won, he still is being taxed for being black. And that's that idea that some of us, this is what we do and we can't excuse ourselves from these issues. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing. Uh, Rafiq, how about you? What is your definition and how do you believe that your career um, kind of goes towards that definition? Yeah, um, I guess I'll, so I'll define what I, you know, think social injustice is and um, mm -hmm. that's when, you know, we have a set of conditions and environment, laws and policies, uh, culture um, that create um, some sort of inequity, whether it's through health, economic, um, inequity, there's, you know, a whole bunch of things, um, just like Robert said, that we can kind of see how those inequities play out. And so, um, you know, it, pursuing social justice is to undo those things and to, you know, create, create equity. Um, and so in my field and in kind of thinking about, um, you know, incarceration and, and substance use and things like that, um, uh, it, it's really about uh, reimagining uh, an entirely different system. Um, uh, America is, uh, in the United States specifically, uh, we are addicted to incarceration and we are addicted to policing and to using those methods to solve all of our social issues. And so um, when I think of what it looks like to pursue social justice, it's really to be imaginative and to say uh, there's a better way to do this. Uh, there are countries who do this in many, many better ways. Um, and, you know, how can we be thinking about that? And um, I think a core principle for me is, is to always be close uh, to the ground. Um, I think one of the, the fears of being in academia is you can be so far removed from the people and the issues that you're interested in. Um, and so I always try to root myself with the people and, and those who are, um, you know, experiencing uh, the injustices. And so um, I, I'm, I'm also very interested in ethnography and so really placing myself um, as much as I can with people who are currently incarcerated or recently incarcerated and uh, just spending time with them and understanding uh, their story and hearing, you know, amplifying their stories and their voice 
Um, and I think, uh, you know, with those things combined, hopefully, um, you know, we can see some sort of change um, maybe in the next 50 years or so. Thank you, Rafiq. Elizabeth, how about you? What's your definition of social justice and how do you or how do you hope to make a difference? Um, so I think intangibly social justice should be demonstrated through every action that I take. Um, sometimes as a sociologist and in the field of sociology, um, people can research things, but they often and write about things, but they often don't like act those out within the everyday interactions of their life. And I think that's like really important, like bridge that disconnect. Um, if something's important to you, it should permeate every part of your life. Um, and so to me, that's really important, whether it be in teaching or in research or in the ways that I interact with like students or coworkers or community members um, or the opportunities that I take. Um, and then tangibly, it's promoting um, equity with the goal of equality um, of resources and encouraging others to move towards values of social justice. So it's not just um, being socially just for myself and my small community, but promoting it for others as well and showing them why that's a good direction to move into. Um, so personally, in terms of how I act that out, um, I've taken a lot of steps, uh, including different fellowships and that sort of thing, um, purposefully uh, to direct myself towards teaching in the CSU system or at the community college system. Um, because I think when you have a PhD, there's also a responsibility to share that knowledge um, because that knowledge isn't yours um, necessarily, it's for the community. Um, and uh, hogging it all to yourself is no good. Um, so I want to promote and share that knowledge and then also um, promote those toolkits because as a sociologist, we have a lot of toolkits that are applicable across many different areas of, um, of work. Um, so I want to share those toolkits. And then also I intend on using my research to promote and implement structures and policies for equity and resources um, in policies, formal governmental ones, but also informal policies too. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so we put the link to the survey. We'd ask that if you please take the survey at the end. We still are gonna open it up for questions if anybody has questions for any of the specific panelists, but I just did want to um, draw your attention to the chat box. It does have a link for that. And it also has a link somebody did share about um, the YouTube clip um, that Robert talked about. Um, so it is, they did find it on YouTube, so somebody did share that as well. So before we go, um, is there anybody that would like to ask any of the panelists questions? You can go ahead and unmute yourself or any comments, anything that you'd like to share or ask. Does, I don't think I can see everybody. So we're gonna go through the panelists one more time and just ask if there's any last, maybe like one or two minutes. Uh, uh, anything else you'd like to share with the group? Gabby, we'll start with you. Is there any kind of um, ending remarks that you'd like to share? Like in terms of career, I think um, if I would have to do it again, I would reach more out to my professors uh, because you know, my family couldn't give me like a lot of guidance. Give me a lot of guidance in my career. Okay, there's something else running. So I think I like, uh, okay, so let me go back. Sorry, I opened the link. So <laughs> yeah, so I think I would write, and what I also would recommend now is I had very little ideas what uh, opportunities there were in my field. If I would do it again, I would do an internship early because you know my fi family could not give me guidance because I was the first generation to go to college. So I think this is what I would do nowadays. I relied a lot on my peers who didn't have that much of an idea either. So they were supportive otherwise, but I think I would reach more out to my college professors nowadays if I have it again or get real job experience if I would have to do it over. Thank you, yeah. How about you, Ingrid? Ingrid, any last lasting? Yeah, so mm -hmm. I will tell everyone to like have goals. Um, uh, set like a timeline or like, or ask yourself where I wanna be in five or four years from now. Uh, work toward that goal. 
and also do internship, find mentors, ask questions, be curious, and don't be afraid of making mistakes or asking others. Um, uh, people, if if you ask, people are uh, a lot of times you most of most of the time you you are gonna find people that are really open to share the experience because I'll, we we are humans and we love talking about ourselves and brag about like our accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So ask people um, if you have in uh, if you have like any curiosity or if you don't know, if if you don't don't really know what they do in that field. Um, also, besides having a plan and working toward your goals, remember if, if you are in a helping uh, in, in like a social work field, just be mindful about like how how you want to be helped and that way help others and also how you want to be heard and also hear in that same way others. So be empathic to others. Thank you, Ingrid. How about you, Robert? Any, any uh, last comments? Well, just real briefly, for those of you on the call that are wondering, what is it like to be a doctoral student? You have two of your fellow Zoomers in here, Rafiq and Elizabeth, who speak like doctoral students. It's a different mentality, but it's so invigorating to hear it and see it. And so if you're wondering, man, why in the world would you want to pursue? Here are two phenomenal examples that I hope that they will share their contact information with you. And then last, if you have a chance, uh, read, read, and read as many types of sources of information that you possibly can. Monographs, articles, especially peer review, uh, books, magazines. Just read, read. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I completely agree. I know Elizabeth already put her contact. You put your contact information. Oh, Rafiq just put it in there as well. Um, so Rafiq, any last words of wisdom that you can share with um, students, colleagues, things like that? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know when this happens and I think it's like a cultural staple here in the US, but we, you know, we have it in our head that we, uh, you know, you select your major when you're like a senior in high school and you're spo that's supposed to determine what you do for the rest of your life, which is, you know, bizarre in so many different ways. And, you know, that didn't work for me. That's why, again, like I said, I spent five years at PCC. Um, you know, in my fourth year, I tried to transfer and I got rejected from every UC that I applied to. Um, and, uh, you know, I had, had a struggle and, you know, eventually found my way. And, uh, you know, I guess the thing I would say is there, is, there isn't really a linear path. I mean, maybe for some people there is, but um, I think more often than not, the path is not very straight and linear. Um, you kind of go all over the place and, uh, you know, it's, it's just not going to be super clear cut. And, and I think that's actually beautiful. Um, I, uh, you know, at, at the time when I was at PCC for my fifth year, and all my friends were already, you know, from high school had graduated, were already in grad school, and, you know, I had still hadn't transferred. You know, of course, it was kind of challenging and rough to see that. But now when I look back, um, I, I feel so much more secure in, in what I want to do and what I'm doing now. Um, and I think it's because I took the time to really think about it and to try different things. And um, so, you know, who cares about how long you're in school for? Who cares how old you are when you start something? Um, I'm, I'm about to turn 30 and I'm just starting my PhD. So, I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, just, you know, do, you know, you know, think about ways in which you can try different things out, ask questions, never be afraid to, to email or meet with your professors. That was something I learned at PCC that, um, changed, you know, the, the trajectory of my life was just, um, I'm not afraid of professors. I actually, you know, love going into their office and, uh, they love it when you come into their office too. So just know that uh, you really make their day. So um, yeah, those are a couple things I would say. Thank you. Elizabeth, can you just give any lasting comments? Yeah, um, so mm -hmm. two last bits of advice. Um, keep in mind that as a community college student or a student at any level, the skills that you learn in school are translatable to a job. Um, any of the skills you learn, so like writing, teamwork, analysis, critical thinking, all of those are translatable to many different types of jobs, whether it be in the field that you have a degree or in a field that you don't have a degree. Um, I've had to switch degrees. Um, and when you're doing that, um, it feels like kind of you're 
lost um, if you're getting a job in an area that you don't have a degree in. Um, but you shouldn't feel like that because the skills that you learn do translate across degrees. Um, and then also um, to second what a lot of people have said uh, about networking. So use your network, build your network, which means like internships, getting to know professors. Don't just get to know people in school though, get to know people who are doing jobs that you wanna do, like reach out to them because that's what they call strength of weak ties, meaning that you have that connection and you can draw upon that connection later on when you want a job. You can say, hey, can you tell me about this job? And they can be like, hey, wow, okay, we have a job opening up at our organization. Um, and that's the way a lot of people do get hired. And then internships, so important. Um, my first job, which wasn't related to anything that I'm doing now is entertainment marketing. I did an internship because it was required of me. And they hired me after that. And I had a decent paying job for a couple of years before. So like that's one of the best ways to get um, to get a job is through an internship. And I highly recommend Thank you. Uh, Ingrid, somebody did ask you, um, what do you do exactly? What are your, what do you do exactly to help the homeless? If you could just give us maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds before we leave um, to what exactly that you do for the homeless. So I'm the housing um, case, ma housing case manager. I help them. Um, I have already um, clients that are already housed. I help them to maintain the ho their housing. Um, like I assist them with food supply, any food items that they need, um, income, if they need to be connected with any um, uh, benefits. Um, I also have new clients that come to the shelter, but right now, unfortunately, we are closed. But when the shelter, well, when the shelter is open, we help them, we do an assessment, and based on that assessment, we help them to find the different housing opportunities that they have. And, and we help them through the process to get a house and also to move in. Uh, when they move in, we help them with, um, uh, furniture, um, any any like things that are need for their house, and also if they don't have a bank account, we help them to set up a bank account. We um, technically we help them through all the all the process from the beginning when they were when they are uh, looking for help, get them house, and then help them to man, to stay housed and. Um, if I, I actually share my email, my contact information with that person. So she can, if she has more questions, she can just email me and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you to everybody. We have an awesome um, keynote speaker right now at five o'clock. Um, so if you can just jump Zoom rooms. Um, so, but I just want to thank the panelists. Thank everybody who showed up. Thank you with the panelists. You guys were all awesome um, with sharing your experiences and things like that. So I just want to thank you all and thank you everybody for being part of our conference today. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.